Welcome to the uh, session SB5. This session is very uh, special because a lot of uh, uh, rooms focus your attention in the important problems, focus your attention in energy, focus your attention in water and waste and mobility and uh, transport and another aspect, emissions, but uh, food, uh, agricultural, is unusual in these uh, forums, in this uh, congress, no? Uh, in my idea, it's, uh, the uh, agriculture is very important. It's essential for the cities, no? Uh, for instance, today, when you ate uh, uh, food, no? Or uh, yesterday in Barcelona, the tomato you taste, it's produced not near to Barcelona. To produce approximately 1,000 kilometers to Barcelona. This uh, situation, this uh, transport, these tomatoes, uh, 1,000 kilometers, generate important impact, uh, important use the non renewable energy no? to produce to problems, to logistic problems. No? The food is very important, very important for the city now and the future. Uh, the, the agricultural um, idea, the agro-urban, it's not homogeneous. Uh, the agro-urban, it's a topic, a big topic, it's umbrella. Uh, this topic, they are different uh, 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 experience, no? Today present different experience. One, periurban agricultural. It's uh, the first startup to the agricultural near to the cities, no? After that, urban space, no? Today present very good experience in this area, no? And in the future, in building, no? Now a lot of groups working in vertical farming, working in new strategies to uh, use, to integrate to the symbiosis agricultural and building, no? I, this, these activities uh, integrate a lot of actors, no? Uh, farmers, of course, no? Of course, no? Uh, integrate uh, NGO, uh, administration, architects, uh, urban la uh, landscape institutes of planning, uh, uh, individual actors, food managers, urban uh, gardens, a lot of actors, uh, stakeholders, to relationship to the foods, no? And this presentation now, it's to the experience, no? And the motion to, to the agriculture in the city for different uh, speakers today. The first speakers, Roman, please. Uh, thank you very much. Roman, Roman, sorry, Roman, Ben, and Pan, okay. Yes, good evening everybody, and welcome to the fresh revolution as we call it. If you're imagining uh, bringing food into the city um, at, a, at a large scale, that's, that's a, a pretty fresh revolution, I would call it. So, um, my name is Roman Gauss. I started out with Urban Farmers about three years ago, and I must tell you, my mother-in-law and all people in my family have absolutely called me crazy to go out and, and try to do this. Uh, it's been a, a lot of uh, a rewarding experience so far. I'm really happy to, to be here and share some of our experiences. So I'm starting out with a very, 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 um, let's say, inspirational uh, idea of what are we going to do with all these urban spaces, including rooftops. And um, so there's some people that build swimming pools on, on, on buildings, like this, this image, image here on the uh, Marina Bay Sands in Singapore. But of course, you could do other things, including a farm. And um, we have a vision to say that up to 20%, we think 20% is a, is a good goal to achieve, should and could be grown in the city. So what you need for that is really the, the stuff that we provide as urban farmers is really what, what makes this happen. So we see three things. First is you need to have systems, okay? It's not something that you can just do on your own. It requires an integration of of, of a system to work to grow this food. Uh, you need to work with technology and operational know-how. Farming is not a hobby. Farming is a profession 
And if you're really serious about urban agriculture, you should see yourself as a grower rather than a, a hobbyist come farmer. So that's a really, really key uh, differentiator of urban farming versus urban gardening. And ultimately what we see is, is really crucial once you have that system and you have the know-how to grow the food, you actually need also a brand and a distribution into the city to sell your produce. I'm highlighting here a couple of aspects which I think are really driving globally the need for urban agriculture um, from various levels. And these are really big mega trends that we're, we're going to see in the next couple of years. So starting with food safety. Food safety. Traceability of food. If you're growing local, it's much easier than if it's produced thousands of miles away. Consumer demand. We hear this very often, both in Europe as well as in the US and elsewhere. People prefer locally grown food even over organically grown food. Because locally grown food warrants to some extent the freshness, the taste, and also the sustainability aspect of that produce. Urbanization across the globe, a major aspect, you know about it, it's been talked a lot in the conference. Retail innovation, we see a lot of our retail customers really asking, asking for new produce, for new freshness, for new taste, for new solutions in terms of shortening the supply chain, eliminating shrinkage. So if, you're, if you think of our global system today where food gets transported you know, from one end of the, of the world to another one, that's not very efficient if you look at the, at the waste in the system. And food security is another ma major aspect that we're going to see globally. Um, what we're doing as a company, we're specializing in a technology called aquaponics. I think this is particularly valuable for an urban environment, but as you're going to see, we have also an application for, let's say, large-scale industrial farming with this technology. So what we're doing is we have aquaculture, so we're growing fish commercially, we have a fish farm, and the fish farm puts off a lot of nutrients, a lot of waste from the fish urine and fecal, that fishes that we can use as organic fertilizer. And by recycling that water through plants, we basically create a closed loop system of fish and vegetables going in synergy with each other. And to give you a little example of what that can do, um, with 1.4 kg of fish feed, we can grow freshwater tilapia 1 kg. So with 1.4 kg of fish feed, I can grow 1 kg of fish. But with the affluent wastewater from that 1 kg of fish, I can grow up to 5 kg of resource-free, CO2-free vegetables. And that's pretty exciting if you think about the water footprint and the energy footprint and the nutrient footprint of, of our fresh produce industry. So what can we grow? Anything you can imagine from you know, the green salads, the tomatoes, the herbs, the fish, the berries. Uh, the peppers, the cucumbers, and possibly in the future also other, any other thing that can grow you know, in this, in this closed-loop environment. When we started out as urban farmers, people said, that's crazy, how are you going to do it? Uh, how is this commercially viable? What is that all about? Show us. So we, we developed a little showcase. It's been touring around in Switzerland for the last two years. Basically a containerized farm. Inside the container you have a fish farm growing the fish, taking the nutrients up until the green, up to, top of the greenhouse. Greenhouse has plants, recycling the, the nutrients, getting them back into the fish tanks. And basically what we're saying is you can put this onto a parking lot and you can feed a family of three for the entire year on that parking lot. So you can sell your car, buy the, roof, buy the container farm and basically become self-sustainable. Of course that's a, that's a, a crazy idea, but it's, it's, it's basically giving people inspiration to what could, what could come next. What came next in our, in our example is a rooftop farm, a commercial rooftop farm. So we're growing food commercially here on the level of, let's say, making it a, a business, a business proposition for a grower. And um, this is our pilot farm. It's currently uh, 250 square meters. And on that farm, year in, year round, we're growing about five tons of vegetables and about one tons of fish. So we could feed with this 250 square meters of rooftop space we can grow up to 100 people year in, year out with that type of produce. So with the vegetables, with the fish, 100 people. So you're asking yourself maybe, hang on, we have 250 square meters, you can feed 100 people, 
Does that mean you can grow and live on 2.5 square meters per capita? And that's not exactly true because, of course, you also have other dietary needs. You still eat cheese, as in the example of the Swiss, and chocolate, and your meat, and, and your dairy products, and your rice. Of course, that's not going to be grown on the city unless you have very, very large spaces uh, making it commercially viable. But uh, the fresh produce, for sure, the tomatoes, the cucumbers, the herbs, the salads, the fish, particularly the fish, absolutely, we can grow that in the city on a very, very small footprint per capita. That means intensive growing under glass using the state-of-the-art technology that we have. So this is how this looks. It's basically full packed, packed greenhouse where we have a seasonal crop rotation. So it's not that we're growing tomatoes in winter in Switzerland if it doesn't make sense. We grow the field salad and the herbs and then we're switching to a, a spring and summer and autumn culture. And with the fish, the freshwater uh, fish, we keep a year-round production pretty stable. We're growing vertical to some extent. Also here, we're seeing some rafts. These are nutrient film techniques where we're sending the water with very, very thin layers of water through the system. It's being recollected and then pumped up one further story. And then you have another layer. You can add artificial lighting, of course. You can add all kinds of aspects to increase productivity. But uh, this is the first stage of showing that it's a commercially viable farm to grow at this type of scale that type of food with the labor and the productivity going in, making it a business. Uh, two minutes. Uh, we've been three, three minutes. We've been approached by Migro. Migro is the largest uh, food retailer in the country, in Switzerland, also striving to become the glo globally recognized uh, premier food retailer in terms of sustainability. We've been listed at one of their uh, big supermarket outlets just 500 meters from our farm basically selling the fish and the vegetables in one market booth on our own brand in that store. Uh, consumer reception has been phenomenal. We've been sold out mostly uh, at 10 a.m., 11 a.m., and then people signing up for the fresh produce the next day. So clearly, from a consumer acceptance, showing that you know, once you have a solution that this stuff can be grown and sold under the right quality, it's definitely a huge demand. Fish. We're importing 95% of fresh produce, fresh fish um, is imported into Switzerland. Only 5% is locally grown. Aquaculture is going to be a, a mega industry, and why not, to some extent, also in the cities. Lastly, commercially making it viable, we're talking to a lot of vegetable growers. We're basically bolting up on uh, an aquaponic system into existing greenhouses to grow fish along their vegetable production and we're working with retailers to establish rooftop farming in their cities. Ultimately, why not? There's a lot of discussion about you know, why it's so difficult, what's it stopping, why, why, you know, what are the problems, uh, urban zoning, blah, blah, blah. I think we are really past that question of is it doable? Yes. We now need to ask the question how can we get it scaled? So that's really a a big takeaway, I think, for this, for this conference overall. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, please then. Thank you. I, I just uh, finished a study to different red eyes around the world mm -hmm. into cover to rooftop. Yeah. Uh, I space okay. you after. Hello? Oh, I guess I'm through here. Hi, so um, it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you, Roman, for, for that great presentation. He already tackled uh, a few of the things that I was planning to say. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the things that I also wanted to add to the kind of just along the momentum of what Roman was saying about the, the reasons for growing food in the city and having it close is also that the, the flavor not just the flavor, but also the nutrient content. It, as soon as you cut, cut a, a leaf off of its plant, it starts to decompose and it starts to, to break down. And that includes also the nutrients on it too. And particularly in, in the United States, I'm, I'm in New York doing this, uh, we're getting food from a long ways away and often the food will have been harvested um, up to a week, maybe two weeks ago 
in the past, and, um, and those nutrients are starting to break down. And, and a piece of lettuce that was picked that morning versus a piece of lettuce that's already five, six, seven days old, they don't compare in, in nutrition and, and lab results. So just uh, to sort of carry over into that, the, another sort of one of the importances of, of, of having um, food that, that's healthy and fresh. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the Brooklyn Grange. This is a, a rooftop farm that I run. We have two locations, one's in, in Brooklyn and one's in Queens. Um, and they're on New York City roofs. And um, you'll see some, some parallels and also some differences from, from what you just heard about. Um, we, we have two farms. The first farm is in Long Island City in Queens. It was installed in May of 2010, so we just finished our fourth season. It's an acre, which is, I, I believe, an American term for 43,000 square feet, which comes out to 4,300 4, square meters. Luckily, the conversion is very easy. If I ever say square feet, just chop off a zero to convert to square meters. And uh, it's on the, on the top of a, sorry, I don't know why the, the photo didn't show up, actually, but it's on top of a, a six-story building. Th this is it, the, the one on the left there. I'm not sure why the photo's not. Not there. It's on top of a six-story building, and it's a, a former industrial building, which has been purchased about 10 years ago. It's, on, it's in Queens, but it's not too far outside of Manhattan, maybe one mile out, out of Manhattan. And it's been converted for mixed use, and there's uh, lots of different types of tenants. There's artists, there's studios, architecture, financial, um, theater, everything that you'd expect to see in a mixed-use former industrial building. Um, and the second farm is in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is uh, a former naval site along the, the East River, which is right, right next to Manhattan in Brooklyn. And um, that's a, a, also a very old building. Both buildings are at least 60 years old. And uh, that's on top of an 11-story building, and that's 6,500 6, uh, square meters. Similar usage on the inside, although it's still a little bit rougher, a little bit more, more industrial, that building. So both of these farms are, uh, what we grow in is called a green roof. And, and what is a green roof? Just to take, a, just to take one step back to, to sort of say, what is this? And it's simply a covering of vegetation and a growing medium which is planted over the waterproof membrane of a roof. We did not invent the idea of a green roof. It's been in existence for 20, 30 years. And versions of it go way back, for, you know, long before we were alive. But the Germans in, in, in parts of, of Western Europe really started sort of taking it forward. Um, however, these green roofs, not, none of them had vegetables on it. That wasn't really the idea 20, 30 years ago when the green roof started developing more and more momentum. And it's an industry that's been growing in the United States and I, I believe Western Europe, uh, all, all around Europe, uh, Mexico City, et cetera. And its growth rates are around 20, 25% now and it continues to, to elevate every year. So more and more roofs, this is becoming more of a common practice. Um, and as it says at the bottom, what we did is took the, I say traditional, even though it's only uh, one generation old, and we expanded that to add more fertility and to occupy the roof uh, in an active manner with a commercial operation growing and selling vegetables. And what are the reasons for green roofs? Um, stormwater capture and energy insulation are the two primary reasons. Um, particularly in New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago, Toronto, Mexico City, um, Berlin, uh, the reasons for it, stormwater capture are, are very, very real because the cities spend lots and lots of money on treating the stormwater because when, when the infrastructure was built, uh, probably many hundreds of years ago, no one had the foresight to imagine that the city would one day become one massive uh, piece of impermeable surface, meaning asphalt, concrete, rooftops, etc. And when we get heavy rainstorms, all the water goes straight down the system into the sewers, and it mixes with, with human sewage as well, and uh, excrements and toxins and things like that, and then ultimately ends up in the bodies of water. Um, so so uh, environmental agencies have identified this green infrastructure, which we call it, in any ways to sort of return the city slightly more resemblant to its natural state in terms of being more of a sponge-like material and hold some water. And that actually has a positive return on investment versus the many ongoing annual recurring costs that go on in, in treating the water. Another uh, benefit of a green roof is the insulation to the building. 
um, especially during the middle of the summer, having a plant canopy, a moisture, and an extra layer significantly reduces the amount of, of heat that travels into the building, thus less cooling that takes place to make the building habitable in the middle of the summer as well. And you can see that in, firsthand when you, you're up on our roof and it's cooler on the roof on a 90 degree day, um, on a very hot day, it's cooler on the roof than it is at ground level where you're just around all this asphalt and road and, and concrete. Um, so our business, we, we adhere to something, we call it the triple bottom line, and that refers to income, uh, which of course we need as a business to stay in existence, the environmental benefits, and also community benefits. And we also have an organization, it, it started from, uh, with a riff off of Slow Food, which started in Italy, here in Europe, uh, and it's called uh, Slow Money, and it, and it qualifies as that. It's, it's looking at investments into businesses as, how is this going to help the infrastructure of the city not, not only just to turn a quick dollar and, um, you know, and to be sold or something like that. And uh, in, in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to keep moving, but, but we'll go through it very quickly. We grow and sell vegetables, and, and we pay farmers on the income side. Um, we already heard about the proximity, but you can imagine some of the business benefits of, of reduced transportation costs, especially getting into and out of New York City with big trucks is very expensive. Um, we, we have environmental be benefits we just spoke about, but one additional one which, which we have with farming operation is composting. We divert hundreds of thousands of pounds of, of uh, organic matter, which would otherwise be trucked into a landfill. Uh, we, we can convert that into nutrient for, for our vegetables and get, get free fertilizer and also um, divert things from the waste system. And then lastly, community and social benefits. And, and this is very important as well. And something that our farm has sort of evolved into, uh, besides just the sort of original vision that we had, because what we've created is almost, almost like two, uh, 10,000 square meters of park space as well. And we have education events, we have weddings, we have uh, sunset dinners, and, and we also have lots of education about diet. And um, uh, in, in the United States particularly, the, 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 our, our people, <laughs> have become really, really removed from the food system, and particularly in cities. Cities are massive, masses of concrete, especially New York. There's hardly any park space. There's hardly any extra green space. And it's really only, if you look at the history of our civilizations, it's only like one, two, maybe three generations out of the thousands of generations that, that we go back to as a, as a human race that we've been so far removed from the food system and also removed from, from the source of this and how our diets are taken. And you can see immediately the, the ramifications of this also in the United States. Um, and not just in urban e economies, but also in rural economies because farming has become so consolidated by regions and so consolidated in what's grown. You can go to the Midwest and see some of the most fertile farmland in the entire world. And, um, and uh, all, all that's being grown is, is subsidized grains, corn and soy and things like that. And um, calories have become very cheap to eat meats and sugar drinks and things like that. And, and no, people are not having enough of awareness of what actually has nutrient and what actually preserves the body and nutrishes the body. And that extends into the healthcare system as well. And so there's lots of, lots of dollars that will be spent and wasted in the future on, on treating uh, diseases that could be avoidable if people were eating better. I'm going to fly through this. Uh, this is our management team, but you see that we have a diverse range of backgrounds. I, I personally come from an engineering background. I worked in number crunching for about five years before I became interested in farming. I've been farming for about five years now, too, since I finished university. Um, here's our revenue streams. We sell wholesale to restaurants and grocery stores. We also do three farmers markets per week where we sell directly to the consumers. And uh, we also have a CSA, which is a system of, of prepaid uh, vegetables where people prepay in the spring and then we deliver on a weekly bag or box with what's in season, what's fresh, what's abundant at the farm throughout the season for about 25 weeks. Uh, we also engage in consultations and special projects. We do some canning and jarring. We can quadruple the value of our peppers by making hot sauce with them. <laughs> and that's fun too. And uh, we also have tours and events, which, which I spoke about a little bit, and that's an opportunity to, to uh, introduce the farm to more people as well. Crops, um, salad greens and tomatoes are very important for us. They yield the highest dollar per square foot. 
And we have to engage in, in square foot and, and very efficient farming practices. Um, ironically, those are the two most perishable crops that we grow. So uh, from, uh, if you stand back and ignore the numbers, it makes sense if you're going to grow in the middle of the city, right, to grow things that are perishable. So you can pick them, get them into the customer's hands, and they can enjoy the maximum amount of time uh, before the crop goes bad. Of course, we want them to eat them that night. Um, if we're growing something that can last, a, uh, like a carrot that can last many months in a root cellar, uh, it might start to make a little bit more sense for that crop to come from far away as long as something has to come from far away, right? But ironically, also, we have the highest dollar per square foot off of those crops as well, so it makes, makes sense on different levels. Um, this is a quick summary of our education program. We have over 8,000 children up at the roof since 2010 when we started it, and, and I think we're, we're hoping to make that small impact on those children too. They get to pull a carrot out of the ground or a radish out of the ground and, and see this, where there's really not an opportunity available in their neighborhoods or in the, where, where they live. Uh, we also have many different community partnerships, including nonprofits in the composting world, a refugee asylum for people that come into the country under stress, uh, that had to flee other countries, and of course schools. Um, it's been a busy four years. Sometimes I can't believe it's only been four years since we've been doing this. I'll, I, we won't need to read every word, but we've had a lot of media coverage and a lot of uh, exciting things. We were visited by Mayor Bloomberg in New York City last summer and uh, you know, had to get the place cleaned up for that. <laughs> and um, and some, some important media coverage and, and, and things like that, which, which helped to sort of legitimize what we're doing. Um, also, based on sort of the, the why not question that Roman had, uh, I think we're kind of over that. People don't really challenge the idea anymore because it's really difficult to criticize. Uh, you know, a roof that's just a big mess of rubber, asphalt, or, or something like that that's just doing nothing, uh, why not do something on it? And, um, you know, I'm not out here saying that every single roof should be farmed, but many should. And we, we also have potential for solar panels, uh, community spaces. It, it can significantly increase the size of our city ultimately, if you look at it in terms of how can a roof be used productively. We have many different projects happening in the future, including mushroom production, and that is all. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. No, I'd love to go. Really nice side. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. The, Let's go. Uh, fun, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Oh, uh, website of looking Manhattan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Will it be done for me? Oh, yeah. Fantastic. It's like magic. It's fantastic. Okay, 12 minutes. I'll see what I can do. Um, well, I'm a bit of a cheat, actually, because I am not any good at growing whatsoever. I'm an economist and I'm an ex-politician. Um, but as a mum, I'm also driven by a concern about the environment. I'm, cons I'm driven by a lack of urgency in the international debate on climate change and all matters to do with the way we use our resources. And I'm struck that no matter what politicians say, the poor get poorer and the rich get richer. So, how in an urban setting might we as individuals stop feeling so bad about that and start changing the way we actually live our, our lives? How can we go from a place that looks like this, which is where I live, it's a town in the north of England, 16,000 people. It's got marginal land to grow on. It's got failing schools. It's got obesity problems. It's basically a town that some time ago was left behind. People living in the bigger cities of Manchester, working in the bigger cities of Manchester and Leeds. How can we turn it into a town that lacks pride? Into a town that actually feels good about itself and has propaganda gardens of edibles sprouting up all over it, on its sidewalks, at its station, at its police station, in front of its hospitals. How can we actually use the power of food to change the way we think about ourselves, to change our responsibilities towards the environment, and just maybe, without anybody's permission, or without any checks dropping through our letterboxes, without a strategy document in sight, or a policy brief, how can we ourselves take control of a different future? A future where our urban centres actually are the centre of, of a wonderful edible revolution. And given that Jonathan Porritt's latest book tells us that by 2050, 40% of food will come from urban areas, isn't it a pity that in my country, most of the places that teach the growing are closing down? 
So rather than moan about it, six years ago, we invented a proposition. As I say, we didn't have a strategy document. We didn't have a policy. We didn't do a consultation. We didn't ask the politicians. We just invented it. In fact, I invented it on a train journey in two and a half hours. And here's the proposition. Is it possible that we can find some medium through which we can feel good about ourselves, through which the poor in our societies can start to have pride in the place that they live, where people have got aspirations, where people are seeing spaces around them differently, where people are starting to redefine a sense of community and a belief that they themselves are part of a solution to the way that we live our lives, not a problem. So if that was a, the experiment that we've engaged in for the past six years, here's the model. We put local food at the heart of how we think about community, learning, and business. And through completely nothing other than volunteers and people in the community agitating around local food themselves, attempting to build local resilience. And the question is, if we can do that in a town of 16,000 people, could we also spread that? Not scale it up, but spread it. Could we see neighborhoods in cities? adopting the incredible edible model? Could we see far-flung communities that have felt that they've been left behind adopting an incredible edible model? And through that, redefining their prosperity simply by growing and cooking food? The answer would seem to be yes. Here's some slides of what we've been doing in the community. First of all, without anybody's permission, because I see no point in asking the authorities permission when they're likely to say no. So my suggestion is always get on with doing it and then ask for forgiveness afterwards. So we take a space which you can see on the top right hand, which is a, a dog toilet, basically, an unloved verge on the side of one of our roads. A verge that time has forgot, a verge where people used to throw their cans. And we, because of volunteers, start to plant it up with herbs and fruit trees so that it starts to look like a place that you can be proud of. The interesting thing about planting uh, food in urban centers is that it actually does encourage the authorities to think differently about their relationship with you as well. Because having ignored this dog toilet for a long time, the local authorities, 18 months on, started to mow the lawn and put a bench in there so that the locals could enjoy it. Most people want to do the right thing in an urban setting. They just don't know where to start. And then we've got my friend's Mary's garden, which is there's a street at the bottom of one of our estates where some of our poorer communities live. This was a perfectly normal garden once, but we took the wall down, we took up all the flowers, and we planted edibles. And then a local sign maker made a sign for us to say, this is what's growing in this garden, these are the seasons in which you can pick it, and this is what you can do with it. Because so many of the people we work for and with do not recognize food that's not in a plastic bag in a supermarket. And just take it for granted that they can't grow any of this locally, it has to be flown in from Kenya or Egypt or wherever, which is complete madness. Now, the interesting thing about all our community gardens are, because they are propaganda gardens, they're there to share. Every single propaganda garden we create is for food for sharing, because we're trying to recreate create through food a sense of community. But unfortunately, we live in a society where it's get your hands off what's mine. So it takes people a little while to get the general idea that they, we mean it. Eventually, people do climb over that wall and start to pick herbs or fruit or whatever it might be. And this is what happened two years ago, when one of those people from that poor community was brave enough to stand in that garden and pick their own vegetables. A little later, the child from that family came back and put the outside leaves of the vegetable in the compost bin, which is wonderful. But more significantly, the following morning, a bowl of soup was left on Mary's front doorstep made from the herbs and vegetables grown in a garden by a complete stranger. And that is when we knew that you can pull together as a community and you can redefine what you want for your future. And then we've got this in the backyard. You know, there's nothing very clever about anything we do, but it is joined up and it is inclusive. We've got a health center, brand new health center, surrounded by prickly plants that are inedible. What is the point of spending public money on that? So we turned it from an inedible health center to an edible one. We asked their permission. We did some fundraising, and we surrounded it by apple and pear trees, raspberries and strawberries. And we've turned the car park at the back into an apothecary garden. We asked nobody's permission to do that. We just said, would you mind if we got on as long as we don't ask you for money? And they said yes, and that is what we've done. And now we can imagine the people in our community going to that health center and picking the raspberries and picking the strawberries and starting to eat good, fresh food and just maybe being encouraged to grow it in their own front and back gardens. 
And then we've got our job centre, which used to look like that thing on the top right-hand corner. How depressing is that? You've no job and you have to walk over tarmac. So then we turned it into an edible front door set. And people just, again, might have been inspired to do it themselves or reskill in terms of growing. And the same for our community college on a main street. There's no point in having a propaganda garden where nobody can see it. We've turned that community college into an edible community college where people pick from it and then cook in the kitchen. And because we do have a sense of humor, we also asked the police would they mind if we did some edibles in front of uh, where they are, and they said fine. So we built them a raised bed by using some wood from demolition sites, and we planted corn. And the really interesting thing about that is three years on, the police's statistics themselves say community relations with the police in our town have never been better, and they put it down to the conversations that go on over food. And environmental damage in our town is down by 18%, because contrary to public belief, people do not vandalize food. And then we've got our railway car park, because we want people to visit our town sustainably, we want them to help themselves to food. So it looked like that, and now it looks like that. And we have people all over the world coming to visit us, but more of that later. But if you create edible landscapes in people's lives, people will start to ask, how do I do this? How do I get involved? I haven't got any skills. I've forgotten how to do it. So we start with little ones, and we teach them, all as volunteers, to get the soil under their fingers. And we work with some slightly older ones to show them the importance of pollinators. And then we use some, you know, sometimes there's no land to grow on, but there might be a local authority who's getting rid of some boats with holes in them. So we get somebody to give them to a local school and they can plant up in there. Or we plant up in tubs and tires. Or we use disused tennis courts like that, where we have made enough raised beds so that the local community can adopt them. And then you get things like this lady who knew nobody and nobody spoke to her, suddenly showing that she is a Bengali bean grower and she is the person to speak to on that estate. And all we've done as volunteers is plant food. And some of our schools haven't got any land to grow on whatsoever, but they happen to be next to a cemetery. So we've worked with the cemetery uh, owners, and they allowed us to grow there. And so what we've got here is young people in an after-school club growing in extremely good soil and not being afraid of a graveyard anymore, because it is a place of life, not death. You can change behavior when you think about local food. And one of the things we did in our high school, which was a failing school, is persuade the local authority to allow them to learn some of the basic skills and now, those people that were going out of that high school with no qualifications whatsoever are going out with what we call a BTEC, a vocational qualification in agriculture, which now includes aquaponics, it includes hydroponics, and it includes traditional growing mechanisms. And from that, they go on to be an apprentice. And it was just the idea of the community to put food at the heart of our lives. But it's not just about schools. It's about the lost arts in our communities if we're really going to build resilience and health and redefine prosperity. So we've put a 1,000 people through a free course to teach them how to bake, or make a sausage, or skin a rabbit, or graft a tree, or whatever it might be. Because if we are going to fill our towns and our cities with edible landscapes, and if we're going to do it when we haven't got much money, we need to know how to do things ourselves. It's not difficult. It's wonderful. It just takes time. And then business. Edible landscapes, new skills, interest in the environment, interest in seasonality. Is it not possible? that we might start putting our money into local companies, in, not to a supermarket, but maybe visiting our local market, supporting our local growers, re-establishing local food economies. Well, we've been working with our farmers who didn't think very much of us at the beginning, so we decided we'd create a campaign called Every Egg Matters. And that was a campaign that said, if we can prove there is loyalty around one product that a farmer produces, and if more people buy that, is it not possible that we will see those farmers investing in more local food. We started by this map on our website. It had four people who were selling eggs to each other from their gate, and it's now got 64. And as a result of that, we've got farmers in our local market who have now upped the number of free-range birds that they've got, the number of pigs they've got, the new products they're preparing to bring on. We've given our local market these blackboards. We haven't got any core funding, but these were things that they could scribble on. What was made locally or grown locally. And that started a conversation, and that encouraged local sales. And now our restaurants and our cafes and our local producers are really gaining confidence in terms of local food production. And 50% of local businesses have said that they have seen an increase in their sales because of what we're doing. We've got more residents growing. We've got more residents buying. And that seems to me to be a heart of redefining prosperity. And we're simply growing food. 
joining the dots. If you bring together all these things, you've got apprentices, you create a, a site. We got some lottery money to build this huge aquaponics hydroponics center. I know we launched that last Monday. I know for the first time ever, we have students at that high school and from poor areas of the north of England who are learning aquaponics and hydroponics when they never dreamed they might be the you know, food scientists of the future. Because this is about giving young people back a sense of aspiration about what is going to be important and food is going to be increasingly important. And besides our aqua, aqua garden, we've got an incredible farm where the same principle applies. We took muddy land up on the top left through our own labours and fundraising. We've created that into an edible farm, um, a, a horticultural training centre. We employ two people here and have two apprentices. And on top of that, we've invented a new form of tourism. It's called vegetable tourism. And people from all over the world come to our little town of 16,000 people. Korea, China, Russia, mainland Europe, all the time, looking at what we're doing. Not because we grow great vegetables, but because we have decided ourselves to redefine our future. And people know that in hard times, that's what everybody needs to do. So we created a green route for them so they can walk around past our edible beds. They start at the station. These are from, people are from Venezuela. We take them past bat, bird, boxes that are wonderful. They've been made and given to us free by a local uh, artist. We put them up. We don't ask permission. They're wonderful. They're our gift to the town. Who's going to complain? And then we've created edible towpaths along our canals. And again, never ask permission because it's our gift. It's our fund. It's our resources. What's the problem with that? And we've created, instead of the dog toilets of the past, wonderful places where people want to walk their families. And along the high street, shops have started to adopt the same principle by putting outside edible boxes for people to share themselves. And right next to our market, we've created something called Pollination Street, where we're actually encouraging people to enjoy and picnic and get a sense of a village green. And this used to be a dead brownfield site. We just took it over, and suddenly it's been adopted with pride in our town. And sharing the journey with us, we have all these people across England. We've got 54 communities. We've got people in Northern Ireland, Catholics working with Protestants. We've got housing associations that are leading the way. We've got schools in poor areas that really want to teach their children that they have a great future if they take it in their own hands. And worldwide, you can see France has gone ballistic. Basically, communities themselves saying, I didn't know how to tackle the decline in my community. I didn't know how to react to climate change. But now I know, one plot at a time, we can build a healthier, happier, more prosperous future. And we've created an edible network so that those communities can talk to each other. Teachers to teachers, tenants to tenants, children to children. Because ultimately, this is about believing you can change the world and believing in the power of small actions through going local food. And that is incredible edible. Any questions, please? Questions? The speaker, one question. I know all the topics. Just a minute, just a minute, sorry. Thank you. I think a lot of us agree about the positive, the benefits of urban farming, but I have talked to a couple foundations who are quite anti the concept of urban farming. These are two foundations specifically in New York City, um, where I am from, and who feel that this is not allowing the development of communities where farming originally came from. And so, and they're inter it's interesting because these foundations focus on urban community development, and this is an area that they don't support, and I have, a very negative conversations with him because I think they're crazy, but have you uh, found any resistance in, in this from, from more uh, traditional foundations? I'm just curious. Um, our rooftop farm in Basel is actually situated on a building that's owned by a very large foundation in, uh, in Basel. And the uh, founder of the foundation um, is now one of the main landlords of uh, the city of Basel, Christoph Merian. And um, the foundation tied our project really back to the roots of their uh, founding um, uh, uh, person and said, you know, the wealth of the uh, foundation lies 
in the land. And you guys are just repurposing land with what was originally was in mind by the foundation, which is, you know, a productive resource. So in our case, very lo a lot of interest, a lot of support also from, uh, from a nonprofit that really saw it connected to their purpose. I could say one word on it, too. Um, I don't know if this is on. Yeah, yeah, it sounds like it is. Um, I, well, uh, I, I'm in New York as well, and I, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised by the comment because we have lots of, uh, you know, lots of foot traffic and support from large, large foundations, um, not monetary, but they come and they support. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear what the, uh, what the groups were. But thinking about it philosophically, I do understand the, the concept of that because here we are at a cities conference and it's all about making the cities better. And, and I think maybe it, it might involve also seeing the forest through the trees because, um, you know, as we do this, and I kept on thinking about it, particularly with your project, because with starting these farmers markets and things like that, we're never going to produce our cattle, you know, at the butcher's table. We're never going to produce our cattle in the city. Um, or if we are, it's a long ways off and it's going to happen in a laboratory, which might be scary anyways. And, um, you know, the cities and the rural areas always have to have a positive interaction with each other. And we're, we're here focusing on cities, and, and that's important. But also remember that the rural economies need to figure themselves out, too. And we can't just abandon 99.9% .9 of our area. And there needs to be ways to make money just besides mining and things like that, which are, you know, arguably not as positive for the environment. So I think, I think someone that really understands this, I mean, even seeing a number like 20% of food production, that might be 20% of vegetables and things like that, but I think grains, corns, rices, animals, chickens, eggs, all that stuff is going to continue to come from outside of the city. And, and I think really to see the forest through the trees is to say, like particularly in, in America where, where I come from and I see the, how, how sort of confused the food system is, to say, okay, so, you know, if we can generate enthusiasm, the, if whatever food we produce in the city is a sure bet that will be con it will be consumed. It is jobs. It's revitalization of problems, and it's around 70, 60, 70 percent of the world's people right now in cities. But also um, that that it'll create people's desire to support regional economies too. And to realize, oh, I don't want to just get something that, that comes in a piece of styrofoam that I have no idea who the farmer is, no idea what types of chemicals and pesticides were used on it, but rather to keep it in, the, in a region where the money might actually come back to me as well. Yeah. I totally agree. Thanks. Other questions? Hello. Um, I, was, I was just wondering, how come there are two Americans and one British, and there is no example from from Spain, for example, or for the rest of from the rest of Europe. Are there examples here in Spain that are yes. relevant? Yes. Uh, okay. I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Uh, okay. Now, now it's uh, for, for instance in my university, no, the startup to the research. Uh, if I, six years ago to, to integrate to in rooftop greenhouse in, in cities, no? And now it's a big project, no? To start up, uh, I invite you. You, you visit in, in Autonomous University very near to Barcelona, no? 25 kilometers. It's, uh, the idea is it's connect to r different aspects, the different speakers, no? But the different, the principal difference is to connect to uh, greenhouse uh, to agricultural to the building and a change to symbiosis systems to relationships to the architecture of the, the building no? for instance to the uh, residual uh, head no? the residual energy to the build to connect to the greenhouse no? to incorporate energy no? or the uh, uh, Rainwater, no, to recover rainwater to the roof, to the to the was uh, greenhouse to connect. The idea is to to symbiosis, to, to integrate to the agricultural in the cities, no, to new 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 vision, new future. No? It's a recently experience. Okay, sorry. Yeah. 
Hello. Thanks for the session. It was very motivating. Um, and I would like to extend her question. Oh, can you hear me now? Okay. I, I would just like to extend her question. And for the rest of the world, if you know of cases of urban agriculture in the global south, and I don't know, maybe Pam could answer with the incredible edible network. And I have a second question for you too, that you said that you never ask for, ask for permission. And haven't you found any resistance? How does this work? Mm -hmm. uh, me. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, there are some great networks. There's a Food for Cities network, which is fantastic. Um, and if you look, if you Google them, they're doing some wonderful stuff all over the world, you know, uh, in the south and across Europe and so on. So that's well worth looking at as an easy one. And by all means, we'd be happy to see what small things we're doing through our network. Um, the permission one is a bit tongue in cheek, really, to be frank. It's just that, you know, I, I'm struck while I'm here in a conference that is dominated by the digital uh, dimension that what I'm interested in is people seeing for themselves the solution of their problems and then deciding how they want to apply the digital solution as opposed to starting with the digital and move. So, so for me, it's all about people gaining enough confidence to use their own resources to offer a gift to their community. And my experience is that if that is what you do, most people don't say no. You know, if you want to take back from something, that's a different thing. And I don't recommend that you go in the middle of the night and dig up the front of the police station. I do recommend that you ask them. But on the whole, people do want to be helpful. And what we've found that is a result of doing what we've done now is the local authorities all over the UK now are starting to put all the spare land that they've got on a register so that communities themselves can just see what land is where and take it over without having to have the risk of being uh, told not. So, no, we haven't had any problems. I'm curious to know from you with the incredible edible, the times you've taken over some very public spaces, uh, the dog toilets you mentioned yeah, yeah. where you go in and take over public space the maintenance of the new edible gardens, yeah. is that only yeah. by volunteers or is it partly city, part volunteer, or how does that, that yeah. work? Yeah, yeah. And this is a question that we throw back on ourselves because what we're trying to build is a more resilient, self-reliant world. And what we've come in from is a world that has victims and people waiting for other people to find solutions for them. So what we say when people ask us that question is, what would you do? So what we do is really simple. We do it ourselves, but then that's not good enough because you're only volunteers. And if you have visitors from all over the world visiting you, then it needs to be show business. So every time we do public speaking or every time we take visitors around our town, we ask for a donation. And that donation goes into an apprentice pot. And so we employ an apprentice to maintain the town center sites. So we don't ask for grant funding from anybody because that comes with too many caveats of what they can do and what we can't do. So we fundraise ourselves as a town. Different towns may do it differently, but that is what we would do. And we would hope, we've only been going six years, that over time we would be able to work with young people from our high school who would see the benefits to their education of doing landscape management as well. But we employ people from fundraising. Any questions? No? No? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a new feature, no? The agricultural, it's a new uh, focus, the attention in sustainability in cities, I think, no? The different speaker to present different experience different benefits, no? social, economical, uh, environmental benefits, different technologies, no? different point of view, no? uh, uh, urban agricultural or rooftop, no? different, and different, 
hydroponics, uh, different systems to produce the foods. I think it's the, this uh, agricultural, it's uh, the future, no? And the different speaker to, to emotion and passion you present the your experience. Thank you very much, the speakers and you. Thank you very much. Thank you.